Welcome, everybody. Um, and thank you for coming for this incredibly, it's a really momentous occasion. Thank you to the Cooper Union. I'm Billy Chen and president of the Architectural League. I've been reading <clears throat> a remarkable book called My Declaration by Danielle Allen. And in it, she describes the writing of the Declaration of Independence, saying, democracies require a distinctive art of writing where groups have to weave together the words that they will live by. Group writing <clears throat> is not easy, but when done well, it heads the ranks of human achievement. It stands even in front of works of individual genius because it involves a greater degree of difficulty. The art of democratic writing entails understanding how to contribute to the collective mind to produce the shared vocabulary that we citizens will use to live together. And as I read these words, it occurred to me that democratic writing is what the Supreme Court does. And in many ways, although one might call it democratic designing, it is what an architect should do. So it is my privilege today to introduce two men who have devoted their lives to democratic writing and democratic design, the Honorable Stephen Bryan and the Honorable Harry Cobb. Thank you. Thank you, Billy, for a wonderfully eloquent and wonderfully concise introduction. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. Um, as a preamble to our conversation this morning, I want to introduce you briefly to the building project that brought Justice Breyer and me together. It is well known that over the past two decades since its launch in 1994, the GSA Design Excellence Program has dramatically improved the quality of federal building projects across the country. And it is widely assumed that the John Joseph Moakley United States Courthouse in Boston, completed in 1998, is one of the early products of that commendable program. But it didn't happen quite that way. And on this occasion especially, I want to set the record straight. The Boston Courthouse was in fact the product of an innovative process devised in 1990 by two federal judges, Stephen Breyer, then Chief Judge of the First Circuit Court of Appeals, and District Court Judge Douglas Woodlock. A process so thoughtfully conceived, and with the help of, Chief of Circuit Executive Vincent Flanagan so well executed, that it became the catalyst and in large part the model for the GSA's subsequent initiative under its then Chief Architect, Ed Finer. As the senior judge guiding the design of the Moakley Courthouse, Stephen Breyer was not a beneficiary of the yet to be created design excellence program. Rather, he was the passionately engaged user client and eloquent advocate in the cause of architecture whose words and, and actions helped bring that program into being. Now, a key element of the Breyer Woodlock Initiative was an overhaul of the GSA's <coughs> architect selection process with the aim of attracting those in our profession, including us, who would otherwise never have shown interest in a government building project. The effort bore fruit, and the resulting shortlist of seven design-led practices was highly competitive. The selection of our firm in the late spring of 1991 was, I suspect, owing at least in part to the unconcealed intensity of my own desire to secure this commission. For the self-imposed silence of the Hancock Tower, completed 15 years earlier, had left me longing to design a truly public building in my erstwhile hometown, a building to be experienced not just externally as object, but internally as space 
and a building that not only need not, but clearly must not remain speechless. Well, I got my wish. And then standing on that splendid site overlooking downtown Boston and its harbor, I faced the question, what should this building say? Luckily, I could turn for help to the two judges, superb mentors who took me in hand and generously instructed me in the elements of American jurisprudence. Together, we then looked at relevant precedents among 20th century courthouses in both modern and classical modes. Seeking, but for the most part failing to find the desired expression in architecture of those qualities that the judges saw as fundamental to the work of the courts. Probity, clarity, restraint, together with an unequivocal declaration of openness to the public being served. Going further and further back in time through the 19th and into the 18th century, we found at last those qualities embodied with unsurpassed eloquence and economy of means in this wonderful little building, the Hanover County Courthouse in Virginia, built in 1735, and now the third oldest courthouse still in use in the United States. There, on December 1st, 1763, Patrick Henry argued the Parsons' cause, a landmark of pre-revolutionary jurisprudence. That was a time when a county courthouse was indeed the center and symbol of its community, playing an important public role that Stephen Breyer in particular was eager to recover in a form appropriate to contemporary civic life. But then we had to face the really hard question. How is it possible to transpose those qualities so perfectly embodied in a one-room courthouse to a huge structure housing 27 courtrooms embedded in three quarters of a million feet of bureaucratic support space. Our response took the form of a 10-story L-shaped building with double-height courtrooms arrayed on three levels behind a glass-walled atrium overlooking Boston Harbor. By thus celebrating both the individuality and the accessibility of each courtroom, we sought to reinvigorate the idea of a courthouse as the emblem of those aspirations and beliefs that underlie our American system of jurisprudence. Judges Breyer and Woodlock explained to me at the outset that a key factor in their selection of the Fan Pier site had been its perceived appropriateness to the paradoxical situation of the federal courts as both a part of and apart from the local communities they serve. And early on, they also drew my attention to another interesting paradox, that while the courts are expected to, to rely extensively on precedent in adjudicating the cases before them, those cases often arise from societal problems that are entirely without precedent. The Moakley Courthouse embodies our shared intention to acknowledge and indeed to celebrate in architecture the opposing terms of these two paradoxes. While this intention is clearly evident in the building's exterior, with its reference to the traditions of its place on the one hand and its emblematic departure from them on the other, it is in the experience of its interior spaces that our preoccupation with these dualities is most explicitly revealed. Having passed through a monumental entry arch, one proceeds through the skylit reception hall to a central rotunda that seems to affirm unequivocally the separateness of the judicial process from the everyday life of the street a separateness embodied both in the serene autonomy of its cylindrical form and in the equally serene abstraction of the Ellsworth Kelly paintings on its walls. But when, one arri when upon arriving at one of the upper floors, 
one emerges into the gallery that gives access to the courtrooms. A panoramic view of the city and its harbor offers a vivid reminder that the courts are not so separate after all, that indeed they exist to serve the contemporary needs of the ever-changing world beyond their walls. Then, turning toward the courtroom, separateness and respect for precedent are again suggested by the half-dome entrance and further reaffirmed within the room itself, where large arches dignify equally all participants in the judicial process, judge, jury, witnesses, and the interested public, while the domed ceiling declares the centrality of the litigants to the proceedings taking place therein. Here also, the duality between respect for precedent and openness to the unprecedented is embodied in the stenciled ornament, which recovers a long-standing New England tradition in a pattern that is derived from the unprecedented form of the conoid glass wall and closing the galleries. A wall through which, upon emerging from the courtroom, one encounters once again the life of the city in all its splendid diversity. Finally, after descending to ground level, one may enter the harbor park and perhaps pause to read some words once spoken by Justice Breyer. This most beautiful site in Boston does not belong to the judges. It does not belong to the lawyers. It does not belong to the federal government. It does not belong to the litigants. It belongs to the public. Here in the Harbor Park, one may relax among friends, enjoy the water's edge in company or in solitude, and perhaps turn to look back at the courthouse that holds the park in its gentle embrace. And here, as dusk falls, one may see affirmed in architecture the principle that every citizen shall have equal access to the law and to the guarantee of due process embodied in an independent judiciary. I dare to hope that one may also sense here an echo of the voice that inspired us, the voice of the little one-room courthouse in Hanover County, Virginia. And now it's time to hear from Justice Breyer. <laughs> uh, you saw the pictures of the building. The thing I guess we'll talk about in a few minutes is, well, how did, how did we get this to happen? I mean, he got it to happen, but I had a role, Woodlock had a role, in how do you get the people who have the money uh, to let him design the building as he did. And that is, well, uh, but before I say that, I want you to know that certainly I think, and I think most of the city of Boston thinks, this is a success. Now, why? Uh, well, we wanted the uh, people who aren't lawyers and judges to use the building, come into the building. We're not, you know, it isn't uh, the CIA. <laughs> and and uh, uh, we have uh, people giving dinners there. We have all kinds of artists uh, exhibiting on the walls. And uh, we have uh, 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 thousands every year of school children uh, who come in in bar association projects to see what the judges do. And it brings people in. They like it there. It isn't just the architecture, but it's designing it in a way that will get the city to come into this building and to say I, what I want to say what Doug wants to say and what he did uh, was, look, uh, uh, this is a public building, okay? That means, I want to tell you something about that. You are the public. Uh, you are the public. It isn't them, the government, versus you. The government is you. So get going, get in there. That's not an impossible thing to do. And really, that design that you have done now, you go to uh, uh, Jerusalem, uh, go to uh, Johannesburg, uh, go to Melbourne, go to Rogers Building in Bordeaux, you will see the same thing. So it's catching something uh, that's about government and pub the public right now. Now we go in there, wherever I look around, I think, what, just beautiful. 
just beautiful. <laughs> Open, brings it in. We have Ellsworth Kelly. Now, Ellsworth Kelly doesn't like this. If I say this to him, which I have, he doesn't like it because he thinks that you should just stand there and look at his painting. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> Absolutely true. And, and uh, I say, I don't know what this works is wherever you are, your eye is caught. But wherever you are, you say, isn't that a honey? Isn't that nice? Isn't that great? And uh, the people won't stop and think about that, but they'll notice it. They won't know what they're noticing. I mean, he told me so much. He taught me so much about uh, what you want when the person comes in. They don't know why their spirits rise, but they do. They, they don't know why they're not that unhappy to come to work every day, but they are, you see? And, and uh, uh, you can do that part. But there is a different part, which is to get you to do it. It's both not getting you to do it, letting you do it. Well, how, how? So, so when I see the number of students who are coming, when I see the number of public events or private events that are held in that place, hundreds, thousands are uh, involved, uh, and the lawyers like it. And, the, the, and you know, if you have a courthouse and we say, uh, there's a pillar in it like that, uh, this is a great room we're in. This is the room where Lincoln gave the Cooper Union address. And if we came in here today and looked at that pillar and there was dust coming out of it and a little heap on the floor, uh, that would tell us something about our uh, respect for historic tradition in this country. You know, and if you go in a courthouse and you see the same thing, that tells you something about your respect for justice. So anyway, that's the background. This building works, so our problem is how can we get some other people to do the same thing and keep it going? That's what I, that's what I right. see as Well, the before we go on to that, I just want to expand a little bit on what you said, especially about who comes to the courthouse, which, because to me the most thrilling aspect of who comes to the courthouse is a program that's been going on now for almost 20 years, almost since the courthouse was built, called Discovering Justice, in which every year, twice every year, once in the fall and once in the spring, middle school children, that is grades five through eight, uh, spend a whole term with the help of uh, attorneys from various Boston firms studying cases in law, and then on, a, on an evening, as actually I think happening this week or next, they come to the courthouse and they argue the case, cases before a judge. And there is a prosecutor, a defense attorney, witnesses, all played by the children who prepare for it. And there is a jury which is drawn from the general public. I've participated once or twice. I don't know whether you have, but it's, it's and, and the jury renders it verdict and it's, it's a, it's a fantastic thing because it's not just being a, a witness, a, not just seeing something, it's actually participating in something. And that from the beginning, I think, was what you were really passionate about, is to get people to participate in their democracy. Yeah, because uh, that's our problem. Uh, our problem, and it's partly yours, but not yours in respect to being architects, is we have, and I see that in my present job, uh, we have a set of traditions and institutions that have worked fairly well, not perfectly by any means. Uh, and unless 18-year-olds uh, and the next generation, the ones after that, etc., uh, know some history uh, and know something about those institutions, they won't have them. And uh, if I want to look for the comparable part, so I, I, it's very much in the interest of everyone in, 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 in public service, and you can ask anyone you want, whatever party, Republican, Democrat, whether they work in whatever branch of government, and they'll say the same thing, uh, because they experience uh, these institutions which do not work perfectly, but sort of putter along, not too badly. And how do we transmit those traditions? So I can put that as a problem for lawyers and for others in public life. If I think of the comparable problem, I, I tend to think being not an architect, that the main thing that I see in, in your, your lives, it, it is a profession, it is a form of art, and the thing about painting or architecture or sculpture is what you have to do if you want to learn it is you open your eyes and look. And I'm not sure much, certain how much there is to say. 
But if people don't get into the habit of opening their eyes and looking, well, they won't have an environment in the city that can give them the joy of life that is possible for architecture to give. That's just a, uh, it's obvious. And so what did Harry do when he came into the environment? I learned so much from him. First, that Hanover Courthouse. What he told us was there are three parts to this. Uh, those two chimneys and the way they are around the, the thing, are, they, they're a kind of a sign, like a cupola might be, that this is a public building. Mm -hmm. And the porch and the position is a place where the community gathers. It was in the center of the city, the town. And they'd go there in the evening and sit on the porch, or talk, walk back and forth. And the inside is the single courtroom where the business of the public is done. What you need is a chair for the judge, and you need a place for the litigants to argue. Problem now, he says, he showed us the Hennepin County, and worse ones <laughs> in Cambridge, Mass, <laughs> and LA. He says, now what's that building up there? Oh, he showed us before that, the, the Beaux-Arts, four courtrooms surrounding a cupola. So you can do the same thing, cupola, public, space in between, people talk and do the business they have to do, and the four courtrooms where the uh, pu public's business is done. Now. That was in St. Louis. Yes. That was when courthouses had not yet gotten yes. so big that you yes. couldn't deal with the problem. Yes, and, and, and then he says, now here's the problem, 17 courtrooms, uh, 22 courtrooms. Go look at the Los Angeles building. Tell me, is that a courthouse or is it a jail? Uh, is it a courthouse, or is it a hospital, or is it an apartment house, or is it a, a, a what? I mean, how do you know what it is? And our problem is just what you say, how did you take the three features of that Virginia courthouse and uh, transform it to deal with a world where courthouses have 22 buildings, 22 uh, courtrooms? 27. 27. Yeah, okay. <laughs> well, you see the result. It, 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 it works pretty well. You have the elements there, the, et cetera. You can describe that. Almost every courthouse of this size that built in recent times has been built in a tower form. And that's what we were able to, I'm going to say, escape from by the fact that you had acquired this site, which was large enough and compelling enough that you could stay, you wanted to stay close to the ground. Yeah. If you hadn't had that site, we would have been in the same predicament that practically all the large courthouses built in the last 20 or 30 years have been under. They all had to become towers. Now, are there, and there's a second major thing here, because he showed us a picture of the courthouse in Brussels. He said, now, uh, what does that remind you of? And of course, it's, it looks like a processional. So you, you, you go up the steps, you walk through the hall to the throne of the judge, who is the king. Is that what you want? No, the opposite of what we want. That's the opposite. I suspect that most of the students here, maybe some of the architects here, don't know that building, but it's a, it's a really memorable building. It's a product, uh, it's a 19th century courthouse in Brussels. And it is grand. And to get into it, you rise a very large number of steps into a hall, a columned hall, and, uh, and the processional again is all about arriving on one's knees, so to speak, in front of the judge. If you want a closer example, go look at the Supreme Court of the United States. <laughs> yes, 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 exactly. Yeah, try it. <laughs> Beautiful steps. Uh, beautiful steps. But now you can't go in that way. Which what? Is, now you can't go you in go that way. Oh, believe me, I, I wrote a dissent on that. Yeah. Ruth and I wrote a public dissent saying it was very unusual and um, an administrative matter. And of course it didn't help, it didn't get us our way, but maybe it'll lead people in the future to change it because they closed the building off from the front and, and we said that's terrible, uh, the, the security. I mean, th that's a problem. Okay, the, that's just one problem. Uh, you do not want what our courthouse has uh, been called, nine beetles in the temple of Karnak. 
Um, that, <laughs> um, at one time that might be fine, but that isn't what we want now. So problem, problem, and how do we get a building that's attractive and that does its job and for 99% of the users will pass unnoticed. If they think about it from time to time, they don't think too much, but they think fine, fine. All right, what is it, was it from our point of view? Because my ultimate, the only thing I can recommend is that you get this kind of combination. I mean, Harry sat there, I think, for six months or for a certain number of months in the courtrooms to find out what judges do. And I heard exactly the same thing with Frank Gehry when he was being interviewed uh, about uh, the uh, Disney uh, 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 concert hall in Los Angeles. And he said he sat with the orchestra for several weeks to find out how, how did it look to them? What did they need? Great. And uh, he said, this was good, because he was being interviewed somewhere by Gwen Eiffel, you know, PBS. And Gwen <laughs> Eiffel says to him, now, if you had a client, uh, the first thing you'd ask him, what would you really want to know from that client? And she was looking for an answer, something like, did he want forms or did he want the, you know, the things that, metal, whatever it was. <laughs> no, he said, the first thing I'd want to know is, what's he going to use the building for? <laughs> hmm, that's a thought. <laughs> that's a that took her, you know, by surprise. Yeah. Um, uh, but uh, there we are. Now, how did we find her? Well, it is true, I think, that Woodlock and I wanted to have a good architect. That came as a shock to the GSA that was used to, uh, that was used to uh, running all these things themselves. And what I would say is that Woodlock and I had to use a lot of low cunning to get our way. And it, because uh, uh, it, it came as a surprise. And they don't know in GSA what we can do to them. The fact is we, we couldn't do anything, but they didn't know that. <laughs> and and, and the, 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 uh, that is a form of low cunning. So we got <laughs> Vinnie Flanagan, and what he got found, he was our circuit executive, and he found enough money in the budget uh, there so we could hire uh, Lacey. Right. And Bill Lacey, who was running the Pritzker Committee at that time, we hired him really to make ourselves credible to the architectural world. And then we got very good applicants. And, and uh, uh, we, Vinny got onto the first round committee, you see. And his job was to make certain that good architects got through the GSA screen, which wasn't such an easy job. But he did it. And he did get it through. And, and uh, 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 we had uh, uh, the final round, was, I'm trying to think, it was you, it was uh, Childs, it was uh, from Skidmore Owens, it was Venturi, uh, it was uh, Moshe Softy. Um, Cesar Pelli, I believe. Cesar, yes, yes. And uh, what we did then uh, was we got into Vinny's old car, Woodlock and I and Lacey, and we drove around the Northeast and looked at the buildings. And we invited GSA, but they didn't want to come. <laughs> okay, great. <laughs> so we can look at it without them. And, and we went around and we talked to the tenants. Uh, for example, in, in uh, your building in Philadelphia, we said, how do you like it? The building's been up for a while. What's the nicest thing about it? What's the worst thing about it? Uh, what is it you feel when you come in? Uh, what, what, you know, et cetera. A perfectly obvious fourth grade school child questions. <laughs> I mean, do you want a building without knowing what, and, and we were told, which was quite right by Lacey, don't choose the design. Choose the architect. If you choose a design, you will simply get something that an architect has thrown together in four months or three months or something in order to try to attract your attention to build a building. Uh, but uh, that is not what you want. You want someone to sit there and find out what your needs are and then design the building. Quite right. And I, at least in our case, it was certainly right. And uh, so we went. We went up to Canada and so saw Softies buildings and then we uh, uh, we, we went around. We, we went to Princeton to, to see Venturi, and uh, uh, we, we talked to people and looked at them. Then we went back and we had the final selection. Now this shows you what we were up against. We thought it would be interesting uh, for, um, 
to film the selection. Film it. If you know we said, we're not the, I've said that already, but we're not the CIA. Film it. So that whoever is selected and whatever happens, other people will be able to learn from that, for better or for worse. So GSA says, fine, we'll do that. And they put up the cameras. And then they didn't put the film in the camera. <laughs> <laughs> and um, um, you know, and some of the some of the uh, 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 people who presented, you know, they, they're used to some were used to dealing with GSA, and they'd say, well, the, the plumbing thing is over here, and this is a, a picture of the uh, sewer pipe, and 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 so forth. You know, and the two of us were on the jury, Woodlock and me, and uh, uh, I said. I said Frankly, I think we save some of these very good architects from insanity, from having to deal with the GSA. But nonetheless, <laughs> nonetheless, you, you saw what we were after. And we did, uh, the committee did select Harry, and it was perfect. perfect. I wanna... it, was, uh, it, was, it, was, it was made in heaven. I don't know that it will ever happen again. And that's the trouble. You don't know. This thing worked, uh, and, and, I, and I don't know what the combination uh, was. But I do come away with this thinking this. We then spent, even after Harry was on board and more beforehand, we're willing to put in a day a week for four years, or maybe three. Uh, half a day to a day. And unless they're willing to do that, it won't happen because somebody has to stay on top of this. You, you having security. Somebody has to be there to say to the security people, now really, do you really need this much, and why? And go into the details, and talk to the architect and say, how irritating is this becoming? Can you do this? What do you want to do? And there has to be somebody that GSA or the government official, whoever is the people, will they listen to that person when he's combined with the architect? And that doesn't mean always do what the architect wants. You, you, you might have to uh, say, look, you've got it. But the architect can do it. They can do it, you know, but they can't do it if they're just given a set of instructions, well, go and do it, and, and the judge or whoever is the person in governmental authority is not paying attention and isn't willing to give the time. It's the same as everything else. People can accomplish miracles, the, the thing that if they're, if they're willing to, 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 to spend the time. And that, I think, is the motto. What do you, I think we were inspired by a Japanese movie I once saw where this Japanese man who is dying of cancer is determined that he is going to get a park built in a certain crowded place in Tokyo. And what he does is he just shows up each morning in the office of the person who is going to give the first approval and says, good morning, good morning, do you have time to see me? And it takes a while. And then he goes to the next person, and then he goes to the next person, and then finally that park is built. <laughs> and you'd never have believed he could have gotten it done. And unless there are people who are willing to do that, we won't have the public buildings. So, so when I talk to people in the State Department or other places, I'd say, you know, security doesn't mean you have to have a horrible building. I mean, millions of people go to see the Sand Chapelle every year, and they mm -hmm. walk through security. <laughs> and a lot of people come into our building. Uh, they walk through a reasonably attractive, it's attractive security, it's not terrible, it's not, doesn't really uh, wreck the place, it's fine. And, and okay, is that I, enough? Is that well, enough I, I, well, I just want to turn for a moment to something that you touched on, which is very important, which is what I learned from you and Doug Woodlock. Uh, and first of all, you understate the number of hours and days that you spent I, 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 literally hundreds of hours with me uh, uh, in, in ways which I think very few architects have been privileged to spend with a judge understanding what judges do. You took me through the entire process of a particular case and I remember vividly you said, well now we've been through everything, there's only one thing I can't invite you to which is the judge's conference. But you took me through every step of the case so that I would understand how, how it works. And that, of course, is something that, and it's not just uh, in this building type, but in any building type, uh, this is a problem with most clients. 
they don't know how to tell the architect what the architect needs to know in order to do the work that we do. And instead of that, they tell the architect a lot of things they shouldn't be telling the architect, uh, micromanaging things, so that you, that, I mean, it's, it's a problem and it's not just dealing with a, this building type, with every building type. But uh, I, I just want to touch on one or two things that I learned from Stephen Breyer that, that I still remember vividly. One has to do with, and you can correct me if I get it wrong, but one has to do with your uh, discussion of the difference between the judiciary, the judicial branch, the executive branch, and the legislative branch of government. And you pointed out to me that both the legislative branch and the executive branch deal with people en masse. That is to say, they deal with entire populations. Laws are made and executed uh, and applied to everyone. They are therefore, you're making a law to apply to everyone. Uh, whereas the judiciary, and, and very few people realize this, I think, and the reason I think they don't realize it is because the newspapers, the front pages are full of decisions made by the Supreme Court, which are world-shaking decisions, and everybody thinks the whole world is, what very few people realize, and what you told me so carefully, is that the judicial branch deals with individuals. Individual cases in which individual litigants are, are competing or uh, arguing, about a particular subject in a particular case. And if it has widespread ramifications, and of course what comes to the Supreme Court almost always does, that's not what you do nonetheless. You're not making, you, you, are, you are dealing with a particular case. And the other thing that you said to me, which, which I still remember is that that case comes to the judicial branch and it is dealt with by a judge and a jury for as long as it takes to resolve. And in other words, it's, it, and that, that really struck me, I've never forgotten that. Uh, the other thing that still sticks in me, because, sticks with me because it did have an effect on my thinking about the building, is your discussion about the craft of judging. That is to say, and it, it may not be an art, but it's a craft in the sense that decisions rendered, particularly in the appellate branch, I believe, are, are that a judge thinks about a decision as being well-crafted and is very concerned that it be well-crafted, by which the, argument is, the arguments are, are well-stated on both sides and well-thought-through and well-resolved in a well-crafted opinion. And that idea of craft struck me because uh, here we have this huge courthouse, uh, which by definition is being made of steel and concrete, and, and it's, it's an enormous undertaking. So how do you bring into the architecture of a courthouse the idea of craft, which is so central to what judges do? And that's where brick came in. It wasn't just because brick was as it was, of course, uh, the native to that part of Boston, uh, to South Boston, uh, but it was because a well-crafted brick building, again, people don't think of it. I don't think anybody explicitly thinks of it, but nonetheless, it conveys to people, and that's why that domed entrance to the courtroom is so important. It conveys to people that somebody cared about making something well. And as it happened, it had uh, a very beneficial effect for us, which I'd like to, if you may want to talk more about, which was that when the, that, that you know, a courthouse, all public buildings are subject to public scrutiny. And you need the support of the legislative branch and the executive branch to get something done. Well, uh, we needed the support, I believe, of the congressman from South Boston. Mm -hmm. 
after whom the courthouse ultimately was named. When, uh, uh, that congressman, uh, I was told, and I, I was not present at the meeting, but you, that when he saw the design of the courthouse, he was thrilled for one reason, because it was built of brick. And he said, those are my people who are gonna build this building, because that's, that, that's the kind of neighborhood, the kind of community that it was in. So he, he was thrilled, and of course, the other thing that I want to say, especially to the architects and students in this audience, is that a lot of people say that you can't get craft today. Yeah, actually, they don't say it as much today as they used to, because, but, but nonetheless, it is widely assumed that a well-crafted building, something where people are really interested in doing something well, is very difficult to get. But I can tell you from experience, not only in the Boston Courthouse, but in other uh, brick buildings that I've done, that, that those masons, without exception, rise to the occasion. They love the challenge of doing something. Uh, I, I mean, to give you an example, uh, both in Boston and in uh, and in a previous brick building in Portland that I did the museum there, uh, we drew every brick. And we, it, 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 uh, it's, both buildings are built in what's called American Bond, which is with six course headers. And both of them turn corners in the way that is important with king closes and queen closes. Uh, that it's not just cutting it off wherever it happens, it's really making sure that the dimensions of the building respect the dimensions of the brick and the way that brick is put together. And I can tell you that in both of those buildings, the bricklayers, the masons, really loved the fact that we had cared about the way brick goes together. So, and of course, this is the last thing I'm gonna say about it, it was very important in Boston for another reason, that, that, I wanted the processional, as I call it, the sequence that you go through from the street to the courtroom. I wanted you to feel when you were entering the courtroom that you were entering the courthouse. In other words, I wanted to preserve the sense that you were still outside. So you have the glass wall in front of you, but, but the wall through which you enter each of the 27 courtrooms is a brick wall because in my imagination anyway, you haven't entered the courthouse until you enter the courtroom. I'm still clinging to that idea that a courthouse contains one courtroom. So, that was, so all of these things are woven together and I hope you can see from this discussion how important the kind of dialogue was to uh, the dialogue between client and architect that is far too rare, unfortunately, in our world. Well, yes, the, the uh, first thing you said. Uh, why, how, how does this translate? Uh, Doug put this well, he said, look, uh, a, a federal judge is a pretty high official uh, in the government, and a trial or an appeal uh, the point is that an individual, whether he's rich, poor, however, the most humble, the most, etc., will take that judge's personal time, not through a bureaucracy, but the personal time of that fairly high uh, federal official to deal with his problem in the law, whatever it takes to get it done. All right, so you say that's, that, that's an important point. We aren't bureaucrats. Brandeis said that the reason the judges have prestige in part is because they do their own work. <laughs> and that, that, that's basically true. And, and, but uh, look, uh, go into the courtroom and you can see the idea here in the Second Circuit where Learned Hand designed the courtroom in the old uh, building there and uh, some of the others. It looks a little bit like a sitting room. It doesn't look like a sitting room which you've designed, but, but the level of the judge is such as to engage in conversation uh, with the lawyers uh, so you get them into a discussion of the law. That sometimes can happen in, in our court right now, in the Supreme Court. It's great when it happens. 
I mean, they're not just representing their clients. You're in a discussion with several of the judges and lawyers about a point of law. So how does this happen? You have to look at the design of the courtroom and the, the, the center is focused not on the judge. See, it wasn't Belgium. It was the courthouse in the Strand, the mm -hmm. 19th century, right. where it's secular Gothic. And, and uh, the work is it's like a marketplace. And the lawyers are scurrying back to and fro, and the judges are part of the furniture. I say they're sort of a talky part of the furniture, but still. <laughs> um, um, you see, and, and you see that in the design of the courtroom. And it works. That's what happens with the jury over here and the witnesses here, and the judge here, and the lawyer is in the center. And it isn't a question of beauty. Fine, it looks great. Uh, but it's a question of that working in that environment. And he couldn't have done that unless he learned how to do it, unless, unless, unless he'd sat there and understood what it is we're trying to do. Now, the brick. Yeah, I mean, you have a profession where, I mean, because we can see, we, Doug and I looked at the number of buildings, they're famous buildings, there's a Charlemagne thing and Aix La Chapelle, and we went around muttering <laughs> Roman X, you know. But he knows what that is. So you go look at the design of the individual courtrooms, and you'll see, yeah, I'm outside this courtroom, it's the rounded, it's the rounded arch, it's the brick, and you go through into a different world. So there are three worlds, the outside, the intermediate space, yeah. and the inside. And those individual worlds on the inside are able to make individuality out of 22 courtrooms. And it does it. It does it. Okay, okay? and, and it, I'm not just saying, look, I, I recommend this. I had wrote a book for my sins about something or other. And, and uh, so we have to give it some publicity. And ABC Sunday morning, spent a lot of time, and they got interested in the courthouse. And suddenly, I'm over there for six hours. They reduced it to 15 minutes. And they wouldn't put Woodlock in, and I, I, try, I showed them the thing, you know, on the wall, where we have in the, in, on the wall and downstairs uh, the name. Uh, it's exactly the same print of you, me, and every bricklayer. They're all there. And they like that. And they take, they take their, they're pleased with it. They're proud of it. And they should be. And Woodlock went over there umpteen times, and every day would look at how they were laying the bricks, and he'd say, I don't think that part is exactly up to snuff, is it? And they'd say, you're right. They'd take it down. And they'd redo it. They got into it. See? They, they got into the thing. And, 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 and then they became really very pleased. And so, so, so we end up uh, with, with, a, with a, you can refer, we're, we're, I want you to watch the program because you'll see how the light comes in, the transparency. And you say, well, that's symbolic because we want the law to be more transparent. It isn't just like symbolism, one-to-one -one symbols. It's, it's that the, the building is revealing what it is that we do in a way that people will find it attractive and pleasant to live there, that is attractive to the neighbors and to those who use it, uh, and functions uh, with the symbols thrown in, if you like. It's consistent with them. Okay, you can do that, you know, you can do that. Your problem is how do you get the government of the United States or others to want it? <laughs> and, and, and that is tough, but it's not necessarily impossible. Uh, you ask for the help. Ask. You're having a problem with the, with the security people because they don't do it purposely. They do it because there is a security problem. And every agency, including judges and everybody else, have what's called tunnel vision. You know, redouble whatever we're doing. Do it triple. And, and uh, that can get in the way of some other things. So ask for it. Um, I don't know what else to suggest. I think I well, wish in the architectural world there was a way of getting what I'd call a good neighbor policy. So after they put up your buildings, we have some way of trying to get the buildings next door. To <laughs> That's another problem. Yeah. yeah it is. Well, the irony is that, uh, as you could see from the aerial photograph, uh, when the courthouse was built, there was nothing around it. In, South Boston on the other side of Fort Point Channel. Uh, and for at least a dozen years after it was finished, there was nothing around it. Now there is a sudden explosion. Uh, it has good and bad aspect. The good aspect of it is that people are there not only, and, and the people are there doing everything. That is to say, there are people living there, there are people working there, there are people shopping there, there are people going to museums there. 
it's a real mixed-use neighborhood. One, one of Della Scofidio's first buildings, the uh, Institute of Contemporary Art, is right there on the waterfront. So it's, it's becoming a very vibrant community because it is mixed-use. The downside, well, there are a couple of downsides, but uh, it, uh, uh, and partly is owing to where it is. You see, it's, it's only a few hundred feet from Logan Airport, which means that there's a height limit. And yet there is also, uh, under the zoning, that you're allowed to build a certain number of square feet. And if you want to get that certain number of square feet within the height limit, you end up with a box, 20 stories high, more or less. And that's what's happening there, and that's unfortunate. unfortunate. Uh, but uh, uh, there's still hope, I think. It's, there are, I think things, I think, Things may get uh, interesting. It's, things it's, are happening. Uh, it's a general problem. The, the building's interesting because it's an example that maybe it is possible to have some success in a world where it is very, very difficult uh, to build uh, buildings such that they will create an environment that will do what great architecture can do uh, 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 to, to the people who just come in contact with it. It's hard. I, do, I mean, I hope this is uh, uh, cast some light. Uh, on how to, how to do this, or that it isn't impossible, uh, that if you do work on it, I mean, State Department, they have people in the State Department that are in charge of art in, archite in, art in, art in embassies, for example, or, or, um, or architecture, and they don't have to build buildings like they did in Chile. If you want to see something that I consider, anyway, a total horror, go look at our embassy in Chile. But let me, since you, you mentioned yeah, art and architecture, and I think there's something that more that needs to be said with respect to Boston and the courthouse program in general about art. Uh, and also it's exemplary of the kind of commitment that uh, uh, Stephen Breyer and Douglas Woodlock made to this project. Uh, the art, um, well, the, there's a process. There's a so-called 1% for art mandated, and there's a process of a very large committee which has representatives of both senators, every congressman, the mayor, uh, local arts groups, and so forth, a huge committee. Uh, uh, I think there were something like 450 sets of slides submitted by applicants for the art in this building. Uh, and ultimately, uh, uh, again, what did you call it, low, low cunning? It's not low, quite, I mean, because- Low I'm cunning sure. prevailed in the sense that, that the committee, I think wisely, entrusted the two judges and me to make a recommendation. They didn't give a rubber stamp, but they said, you guys are thoroughly engaged in this. You're very interested in it. Uh, and they had developed a rather long short list. And they said, why don't you go and, and look at it? And we did something that I don't think has been done in any other courthouse or any other public building uh, uh, that I know of, which is that the two judges and I went and interviewed all the shortlisted, all six shortlisted artists. You came to New York, you remember? We spent several days. We went days. down here. I mean, that's how I think they get, I mean, you can't make this too individualized for the reason that the interest in it is to try to generalize this kind of process so that you can get a building that is a good building. With the artistic part, uh, it is, Harry said, let's go look, and we looked at, what was her name, the, the, you know, the comets. <laughs> the, oh, yes, you know, and, and yes. The, the, Names the, escape me. Right? Right? Yeah. Names and, escape and me. And the, 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 uh, the winds, what's it, the, the stripes that are the, uh, very good artists. And yes. Fox, Donald Judd, uh, because, because wonderfully, uh, Pat Moynihan. Well, you know, the irony is that, there you're misremembering, Donald Judd was not on the short list. He, was not. he hadn't applied, he wouldn't. But when we were going to look at the work of one of the artists who was on the short list, yes. whose name I've just as well screened out, I can't remember. You saw this box. 
Oh, is it very? And bad? you found it. It was a transforming yeah. moment. For you. Yeah, I'm well, going to say you had an epiphany when you saw that box. But who, who is you know who does these, <laughs> you uh, the the air, the space, the, was, the uh, uh, any case? But there were but the care that went into that. And by the way, I had a particular bias, which is also uh, uh, somewhat resistant to to what the bureaucracy wants. The bureaucracy wants to please a lot of people, so they want a range of artists in a courthouse, in a public building. If you have a substantial budget, well, we had a 1% budget for art. It should be distributed among several artists. That's because of Moynihan. Every public building has to put aside 1% of the construction budget for art. I felt that, that... Very good idea. I felt strongly that I did not want plop art in the courthouse. By plop art, I mean somebody over here, somebody over there. They're not related to each other. I really felt that that I wanted an artist whose work would permeate the experience of the courthouse, that you would encounter it. I thought that was very, very important. I, and I believe I was right. That ah, you really no question that you need to encounter this artist. And also the engagement of the artist is only, you're only gonna get the engagement of the artist if you have that situation where the artist needs to respond to the building in its totality, needs to think about the occasion. And, and uh, so we have Ellsworth Kelly, we have uh, 21 Ellsworth Kellys in the building. Uh, Ellsworth Kelly panels. Nine of them are in the rotunda, uh, and the other 12 are in pairs at each end of the galleries on three floors. So you encounter it in the rotunda, and then when you emerge into the gallery, you encounter it again, that same voice again. And that voice is deliberately not the voice of the architect. It's the voice of an artist in the building, in that situation, and, and, and the conversation is very important. Uh, uh, to give you an example, Ellsworth uh, uh, was very interested in the, in, in the rotunda as a space and, and proposed this array of nine panels, which actually wasn't something that he invented on the spot. It was a recovery for him, which is a very interesting thing that happens to all of us. It was a recovery f for him of an idea that he had had 50 years earlier when he was in Paris, when, when he began the idea of colored panels. And, and this array of nine panels was something that he really wanted to do. He came to your we interviewed him in Cambridge, I believe, and he actually brought a piece of paper that he shaped into a cylinder to show us how these panels would look. We could stick our head into it, that kind of. Uh, but then there was an issue. The cylinder is round. What about the panels? And I think he thought, and I thought, that the panels would follow the shape of the, of the cylinder. But then he thought, and I agreed with him, after he thought about it more, no, the panels must be flat and the cylinder curved behind them, and that's the way they, they were done. But uh, I, again, this is an example, the, the, the conversation, if you will, between the architecture and the art that goes on in that building could never have happened if we hadn't had the kind of passionate commitment of the judges to that process to, to, to you know, to make it. Uh, yeah, but it's not, uh, well, I mean, the result of it is wherever you are in that building, in the public space, you look around and you see this combination of the white wall, the shapes, the space, the shape of the space, and the color of the Ellsworth Kelly painting. And it, it's terrific. It means that you're not going to have an unattractive view wherever you are in that building. Right now, he says, well, you have to have the commitment of someone. I agree you need the commitment of, of someone who will appear to be anyway in a position of authority uh, so that they can work their way through the bureaucratic process. 
Would you? I learned from Erwin Griswold when he was dean of the Harvard Law School, and uh, I was beginning teaching there, uh, that appointments committees within the faculty are not to select the people. They are obstacles to the selection of the people. <laughs> and so what you do as a dean is you try to figure out who you think would be good. Now, you're not closing off the committee. You're interested in what they think. But the secret is to guide the through the committee, uh, the people who you've done the work to figure out might be good. That's not dictatorial, and it is not uh, 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 just giving way to whatever whim happens to strike a big committee, because a big committee can go you don't know where. Now that's pe people who are fairly high up in state, for example, will have some talent at doing that. And so if, for example, you were to get the commission to design the embassy, what I've wondered is why can't you try to identify a person or two in the State Department and ask them if they'll take an interest? It isn't a hardship, you know. It, it isn't exactly a, a hardship uh, uh, post or, 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 or a hardship task to go and see six really good artists <laughs> and to talk to them and to try to figure out what might help, uh, you know, try to figure out uh, what might work in the building. It's really interesting and it it's, a, it's a great pleasure. It's an opportunity. And, and there are people in state or treasury or whatever uh, local organization, whatever it will, if they can see this, it'd be one of the great things in their career, just as it is in mine. And, and Woodlock said that, and, and it, it's true. It's corny, but true. I write a lot of opinions. Last night, somebody pointed out uh, that I'd probably written about 600, even on the Supreme Court, if you count all the dissents, of which there are a few. Uh, 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 the, 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 uh, and uh, people are not going to remember those. I mean, it would be nice, but you know, they're not, all right, after a certain time. That building will be there. That building is going to last. And, and uh, you're giving somebody an opportunity. But if you just sit there, I By the way, it'll happen. <laughs> and I, that, I think those who, well, that's. That, that's I want, I, since you mentioned opinions, I want to recommend to everyone here, because it's all available, all you have to do is go on the Supreme Court website. You can read every opinion and every dissent. I'm correct, am I not? You can. And, some, you and they're quite, they make extraordinary reading, especially the ones that one tends to disagree with. I mean, there are some people on the court, you know who they are, uh, who, who have a real gift for the poison pen or whatever, anyway. <laughs> and uh, so, uh, yes, and I think now we should invite them. Since I'm standing here, I think I'll take the opportunity for the first question. Um, Justice Breyer, you have a very profound understanding of the, how meaning is created in architecture. Do you have any um, observations that you'd be willing to share with us about what you're seeing in contemporary architecture as a member of the Pritzker Prize jury? I don't have particularly profound observations. I mean. There are different problems in pla different places. We, we, we went to uh, Europe. I, I mean, I think the, commi the, 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 the committee has been interested in things outside the United States because that's where an awful lot of development will take place. And that's where a great deal of uh, a building will go on. And if, if we went to Europe, which I thought was interesting, Denmark, Norway, and Sweden, since I've been there as a student, you can tell me, I think their problem is that the, the population has grown up in a ring around the center of the city in Copenhagen, and maybe also in uh, Stockholm. Mm -hmm. So there's a risk that they turn the center into Disneyland, while the outside is uh, uh, our apartments and huge buildings, pretty big and pretty impersonal. And uh, you, you see the same double, I gather, when we're in Beijing, triple, triple, except they've torn down the inside, too. <laughs> oh, dear. 
And uh, how are they going to do this? I mean, how is how are you going to create human environments where you have these enormous buildings for housing and work, which tend to look like whatever? And I know that there are people looking for answers to that. Maybe you have uh, a floor levels on the 13th or 15th floor that go out from a cluster and create a park or, or places for people to react so they have the feeling they're in a 10-story building and not a 50-story building. Uh, th that, that certainly is, 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 is one problem. And of course, now the community's been interested in uh, the problem of vast numbers of people who will suddenly move from villages and farms. And that's always been a problem, but it's triple. And where are they going to be housed? And how? And why is architecture in part can it be for people who will not be able to afford the super spectacular architect for a house that overlooks the beautiful bay and so forth? They're going to live in a camp, you know, or close to that. And, and it's not impossible to have a better rather than a somewhat less good <laughs> environment in which they live, even if it's very inexpensive. Uh, it, it's filled with, with difficulties. And, and uh, I think, I think the, the committee gets a lot of, lot of recommendations. And I'm not, I don't think, the great architect on the committee. I think I'm supposed to have a kind of voice of the consumer to ask the architects, why do you think that? Or why do you think this? Or why do you think the other thing? And get them into a conversation with each other. But it, it's not, it's, it's less, I suspect, than it was looking for Michelangelo. Most committees, I guess, have that kind of thing. The first few years of the committee's life, who is the, the architectural critic in Boston explained this to me? Uh, Bob Campbell. Bob Campbell. He says, for the first 10 or 15 years when this committee was set up, it was going to be easy because there'd be all these people around who were alive and they'd never received that award, so fine. The next 10 or 15 is a little more difficult because and then they, 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 they decide to uh, lower the age limit. <laughs> and uh, they're trying to say, who will do something? And there it's pretty unpredictable. And, and then the, the, they get into a, a world where uh, there's so many people, so many people, who, who might easily qualify in, in a way. And then, and then it's, a, it's a committee. It's a committee, and they have Different ones have different views, and they do their best on it, and they have good architects on it. <laughs> the, the discussion of the single room courthouse is most interesting in its connection to your design. But how about the choice of the color of the brick? Is it, was it intended from the start to be a uniform color of brick, or the variated, the variated kind, which was typical of the older brick kilns, where you have mixed colors and uh, I just wondered, is, was there intent to have uniform color or mixed? It's, it's, actually, it's a very good question. No, uh, the brick is what's called a water-struck brick, which is essentially a handmade brick. And it's fired in such a way that every brick has its own individuality. So there is a variation in color. It's very deliberate. It occurs both within the brick and between brick. But it's, it's a very important part uh, because the craft of brick begins with the craft of making the brick and the source of the brick. The, the clay source, where it comes from, came from a particular source in New England and, uh, it, it, and it's fired in a particular way. Hi, great, great discussion. I'm an architecture critic and I'm a big admirer of Harry Cobb's work. Um, I'm also a lawyer don't practice, but I did clerk for two federal judges, one in the Eastern District of New York and one on the Ninth Circuit. And both of those courts had far more space than they needed. In the case of the Eastern District, there's a gigantic courthouse by Richard Meyer on Long Island that as far as I can tell is mostly empty. And the Ninth Circuit has tremendous redundancies. There are chambers that judges may use one week out of the year. There are courtrooms that may be used 20 minutes a month, if that. So as a taxpayer 
and an environmentalist, I found some of these buildings disturbing. And I'm wondering whether your building uh, needed 27 courtrooms. Was there a tremendous redundancy built into it, or was the program um, kept to a minimum? Um, well, you're reflecting something at the moment. I, I think at the moment, the, the number of cases uh, is less, has grown less quickly than it had. Uh, I, I, we, I, we, I think we needed the courtrooms. It, it isn't quite that. You have to factor in that this is a courthouse. Now, you, you could do it in an office building. Jack Weinstein, whom I love, was in the Eastern District. I he's, clerked for Jack. You did? He was great. Well, he, he thought, well, we shouldn't really have rogues just sit at the table and do it. You know, the right. Cotties could do it under a pear tree. Right. <laughs> you can do it that way. But if you do, and it doesn't have to be a palace. But Judge Weinstein, for example, had a courtroom of thousand square feet or more with robing room, jury room, et cetera. Well, I don't know. That, the that he might have used yeah. two weeks a year. All right. Uh, but that's, that's not the point. The, the, uh, you, you have the courtroom there so that it can be used when it has to be used. And the lawyers are encouraged to settle the case. And they probably won't settle the case until they get to the, the door of the courtroom ready to go to trial. And if that courtroom isn't there, we have four more weeks before it is there. So the judge has to have the courtroom or he can't do the job. Now whether you need a big open space, well, what do you want? Uh, the question I would say is this, how can I put it dramatically so you see the point? Please. Think of Little Rock. Think of Little Rock in 1957. This is an extreme case, but just move it down. Uh, Governor Faubus, standing in the courtroom, uh, standing in the door of Central High School, figuratively, with his militia to prevent those nine black school children, the Little Rock Nine, from going into that white high school. Now, he said, they have a federal judge order, but I have the state militia, all right? And why is it? What happened next was well known. I mean, they didn't go in. We have the picture of Elizabeth Eckford turning the other way, and the face of that white uh, contemporary girl in that class, anger and hatred. That went around the world. And uh, he went to see President Eisenhower. That was arranged by Brooke Hayes, uh, uh, the uh, congressman. He told Eisenhower he'd allow the uh, integration. First, really, in the country, it, 1954 was Brown. This is 57. Nothing happened in 55, 56. Very virtually nothing. Eisenhower, I'll do it. He walks out and tells the press the opposite. And what does Eisenhower do? He's advised by Jimmy Burns, former Supreme Court Justice, governor, moderate on race, governor of South Carolina, don't send troops. If you do, you better be prepared to reoccupy the South. You want a second reconstruction? But his attorney general, Brownell, says you have to. And he sent the 101st Airborne. And they went, those 1,000 troops heroes of uh, World War II, parachuted into Normandy, hung up on the towers and shot down. America knew who they were. What's going on? It's not just force. It's a matter of force plus symbol. And they took those nine school children and escorted them into that school. And the, they were there for a short time, for a few months, until the school district uh, got into the hands of other people. And then they wanted to close it again. And then it went to the Supreme Court. And all nine judges signed in Cooper versus Aaron uh, uh, an opinion said, you integrate, integrate. Hey, there are nine people. OK, I understand that. Nine. And maybe there were 9,000. But they had in the South many, many more thousands than that. And it took years, and it still isn't finished, with the Freedom Riders and Martin Luther King and so forth. Do you see what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Who knows why 
in front of us, in 1,500 or 315 million Americans, and I see people of every race, every religion, every point of view, and my mother used to say there's no few so crazy there isn't somebody in this country. Well, she, she said they all live in Los Angeles, but nonetheless, <laughs> um, the, 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 the point is this. We don't know why exactly. We've become a country where even in Bush v. Gore, where I was in the dissent, but I heard Senator Reid say the great thing about that case is never remarked, which is despite the fact that it was very important. It made a big difference to people. And in my opinion, and probably Senator Reid's, it was wrongly decided, as will happen sometimes. We're humans. In 5-4, somebody's wrong. Okay? People followed it. They did it. They did it. And they did it without killing each other, without throwing stones and sticks. And when I talk to the college students about this, I say, I know 20% of you think too bad there were a few riots. And I say, good, turn on the television set and see. And see. See what happens in countries that decide their disputes that way. OK? So where am I going? I'm going to say that's the bottom line. We do live in a country where 315 million people who think all kinds of things all over the world, they're divided all over the place. And you find a few divisions on our court, fine. It's a big country. But we're committed to a rule of law. This is what I feel. This is my job. And who knows why? Who knows all the elements? We've had slavery. We've had a civil war. We've had 80 years of uh, segregation. We've had all kinds of horrors, right? But we're in a world where that rule of law plays a role. And if you tell me, do I think a tiny bit of it, a tiny bit of it, reflects the fact that from day one we had a courthouse like that in, 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 in Virginia, and we had the Bozar, and we do have some space, and there is a symbol, and the columns aren't falling apart with dirt and rust and so forth. And you're not sitting on a desk. I think Jack Weinstein, I love him, but I think he's wrong on this one. Uh, who knows what goes into all that in the public mind, which ends up with a country that has the ability still uh, to run itself on democratic principles. And of course, the truth is, I don't know. But also, I believe that that space, if wisely used, <laughs> And that space of explaining what we do to the public is part of it. And that space, which is attractive, and they don't know why, and tells a message, which I don't know quite what it is, but you get what I think it is. All right. I think all that plays a role. So I think the architecture and the way we do it is uh, part of it. And, and I don't want to lose that part. Thank you for your answer.